Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. What should companies look for in finding a leader? Let's ask Adam Bryan, author of CEO Test. Adam, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for the invite, Bill. Adam, first of all, is this book just for CEOs or do the lessons seep down to the rest of us who might be smaller leaders or foremen or just group leaders? As we say in the subtitle, this is for all leaders. It's called the CEO test because we're sort of asking the question, you know, what can all leaders learn from CEOs about the challenges that everyone faces? I mean, you know, there are aspects of the CEO's job that are unique, but we chose instead to focus on, well, what are the same challenges that CEOs down to sort of first time managers running a team of five people? You know, what, what do all those leaders have in common? And yes, it gets more difficult the higher you get, but we looked at those common challenges and and really looked at it through the framework of what are the challenges that make or break leaders? Like, why do people succeed or fail in these roles? And, you know, that can start off with a list of 300 things, but we winnowed it down to seven. So Now, if I remember, and I'll pull out parts of the book and you can fill out the rest, I think you either interviewed or talked to or spoke with something like 600 CEOs. I didn't even know there were that many. (laughs) Exactly. You know, I I was a journalist for 30 years before I uh, moved into consulting three years ago. But uh, a decade ago, when I was at the New York Times, I started a side project called Corner Office, uh, weekly interviews with CEOs. And it was based on a simple what if, which is what if I sat down with CEOs and never asked them about their companies? Uh, or their strategy or their ind- industry dynamics. I mean, the kind of usual stuff that CEOs are typically asked. And instead, I just asked them about, you know, what have you learned about leadership over the course of your life? And how did you learn it? And how do you think about team building and culture and hiring and talent? Those kinds of timeless, universal questions. And so uh, it's been a fun adventure. I've just learned a tremendous amount. And the patterns that emerge from all those interviews, you know, it's, it's not quantitative data, Bill, but when you have 600 of them, it becomes quantitative, you know. And you're asking the most expert people. And as I said to you before the show, um, if I took two topics that I get the most requests for books, leaders, speakers on, this is for the 33 years that we've been doing the show. It would be leadership and weight loss, I think. And of course, <laughs> you're, you're the leadership. So it, what I'm building up to is why it would almost seem like that should be something, you know, we have generals, we have captains of teams who come up through the Ivy Leagues, through the um, Big Ten and the, and the, the sports um, um, arena. Why is it so difficult to find an arena, a leader in the business world and that we have to have you out there interviewing them and, and finding out tips from them? Well, I think part of the context is so important. I mean, First of all, leadership is incredibly hard, just like weight loss is hard. I think that's why there's kind of insatiable appetite. Um, and I think uh, all the complexities of leadership often get oversimplified, Bill. I mean, it often strikes me that if you began a sentence, leadership is all about dot, 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 fill in the blank, you could literally put any word after that and probably be right at some level. Um, but it's not that simple. I mean, as much as people try and present like cookie cutter templates, do it this way, you know, I always say like there's three important variables. There's your personality as a leader. There's the context in which you're leading. I mean, is the company going in a bankruptcy or is it hyper growth? Um, and then there's the collective personalities of the people you're leading. And so, you know, anytime you go into that with like, okay, I'm going to follow this way to lead, you're going to get into trouble because it's going to quickly break down. That's why, honestly, I, I break out into hives anytime anybody uses the phrase, you know, leadership theory, because leaders, you know, theory implies like a static framework that is always going to work. And that's just not going to happen. I think already I've learned a lot from what you're saying, but I, I want to keep this going because your book is very interesting and you've really done a lot of work. And as we can tell, and you've told us, you've been doing this for years where you ask that open-ended question of a leader. And I'm just always fascinated. Um, if Would you say that if um, I told you Joe or Mary were the captain of their team, their high school president, and maybe second in their college for college president, uh, student body president, Um, Are we pretty sure they're going to be okay, or is that just meaningless? You know, it's a great question, and I've always wondered, you know, is it 
do those signs show up really early? But, you know, what's been so interesting is like, yes, you meet those people, right? Who you could tell from when they were in middle school or high school, that person's going to be a leader. They represent a portion of the people I've interviewed, but there's just so many surprises, Bill. I mean, people, you know, CEOs who started off as elementary school teachers um, who studied, you know, the harp in college. Uh, um, it, it's it worked in theater, um, just these sort of crazy circuitous paths that, you know, very much like about life, right? I mean, you know, especially I'm old enough to say kids these days. I mean, I think a lot of kids these days sort of plan out their career about, you know, by this age, I'm going to have this title and make this much money. And, you know, you start getting a few gray hairs like you and me, and you realize that it's, it's about the connections you make along the way and the people you meet who suddenly pull you in a new direction. Um, but I, I do think the through line for all of them was just that, you know, frankly, they, they just did whatever job they were doing really well. Um, and then they got promoted. I mean, so many people I've interviewed said, like, I've never asked for a promotion in my professional career just because people bet on them. It's like, you did a great job of that. I want to give you more responsibility. Hey, can you can you do this? And suddenly they find themselves as CEOs. And, you know, I think they're kind of as surprised as anybody else. So, um, you know, people are always trying to, I find people are always trying to figure out like, what is the right career path? Uh, and what I always tell people is like the path you are on is the right path. It's just the X factor is whether you kind of make the most of the path you're on because there's lessons everywhere. You just have to watch out for them. One of my favorite stories, you know, um, I, I interviewed people from all walks of life, not just CEOs, but I interviewed a Broadway production stage manager has done all the top shows and stuff. And he said the most important leadership lessons he learned was working as an assistant manager at McDonald's when he was a teenager. Um, and he said, look, you know, there's a lot of similarities to theater, right? You have to, you know, put on a consistent product every night, work with a really, you know, diverse crew in every sense of the word. And, uh, and to me, that's just like a great example because a lot of people might have that job at McDonald's and just go, yeah, it's just a job at McDonald's. But for him, he had his eyes open and he was wringing every insight he could from that experience that he would apply to, you know, later in life. I, I love that example. And I love what you said at the beginning, because it kind of tells me there's still hope for me. Uh, <laughs> maybe after all this time, next time I hear the doorbell ring, it won't be the UPS man. It'll be someone saying, Bill, we know you've been talking to smart people like Adam Bryant. You you know, it's time for you to step up and be the CEO of our company. So I've got go. my thumbs up and my hopes up. You, you made my day. I'm betting um, on you, Bill. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned um, in your book, uh, there was a section that said you asked some of the uh, CEOs uh, the critical challenges that make or break a promising executive. Uh, just like that other tip you just mentioned about the job we would think would be nothing, assistant at, at the McDonald's. And there, that was so important to that one executive. What are some of the challenges that you find in, in the people you've interviewed? You know, the, our first chapter is around, it's really around the idea of strategy and setting strategy. And I think if you are, again, like a first time leader with a team of 10 people, or you're running a company with 500,000, um, I, I think leaders owe their employees an answer to the simple questions like, where are we going and how are we going to get there? Um, and the problem that I've really discovered in the world of business is that you, you would kind of think that the word strategy means the same thing to people. But what I've come to understand is that word itself is kind of a Rorschach test, a classic inkblot, right? And everybody kind of sees different things and has their own ideas of what that word means. Sometimes it's like a super high level, almost just kind of a general description of what the company does. And at the other extreme, they sort of dive down the details and say, Here, here's our 10 priorities for this quarter. And, and part of it is like some people suffer from what I call expertitis, right? They're too close to what they're doing. And it may be really clear in their head, but it's not to everybody else. And so we do a lot of work with our clients just around sort of crafting what we call a simple plan to answer those simple questions like, where are we going? What are we trying to achieve? How are we going to get there? What are, what are the three things that we're going to focus on to achieve that goal? What are the headwinds? How are we going to measure progress? You know, Part of I spent a lot of time in sort of the leadership space and and talking to CEOs and working inside companies, and one of the things I've learned is like 
the, the simplest questions are the hardest to answer, right? Like, what is our strategy? What is the purpose of your team? Um, what does culture mean to your organization? Simple questions, but everybody wrestles with them. And a lot of people have their own approach to it. Adam, I want to delve into that a little more, but at this point in the show, I just want to remind our listeners, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Today, our guest is Adam Bryant. He is the author of the book, CEO Test. Adam, we're going to ask you one where we can get the book and if there's a website where we can learn more of this good information. Sure. Probably simplest just to, you know, if you Google the CEO test and my name, Adam Bryant, you'll uh, find your favorite bookseller. And and every one of those has kind of a detailed description of the book. So that's probably simplest. Sounds good. And the website? Uh, my personal uh, website is Adam Bryant Books, all one word, dot com. Easy enough. And we'll ask you that again. So if our audience didn't get it down, they want to and uh, they want to be a CEO someday or just be head of 500 workers instead of the full CEO, they can do that too. Adam, one of the things you were getting into, and I love that topic, you talk about simplicity. And just in my life, I've always found the best judges, the best lawyers, the best doctors, they can take a concept, I'll go in, they, this hurts, this hurts, this hurts, and they almost cut through everything. And like in 20 words, they solved everything. Or a, a great judge or a lawyer, I'm not even going to say great, but a very good one can cut through the case. And you look and, and you all agree, even if you don't like it, you're on the other side, but you say, you know, he's right. He makes a lot of sense or she's right. Um, can you talk about that? Do we get too involved in fancy words, uh, the tones of the time, the buzzwords, and we forget that it really is simple? Yeah, it, or it should be simple. And I, I do think there is this kind of pull in the business world to make things more complicated than they should be or need to be. It's, you know, one way people, you know, think they're adding value, right? Like if 10 is good, then 20 must be better. Um, but, you know, I, I do find the best leaders understand this idea of just boiling down to like the three things, because all the neuroscience shows that most of us can't remember more than three to four things, you know, day to day, right? Um, but then you have examples, you know, and, and smart leaders get this. I mean, I often think of Bob Iger at Disney, who from the time he was uh, campaigning internally at Disney to become CEO, he sort of announced, these are my three pillars. It's like, we're going to embrace technology in all its forms great content and global expansion. And literally since day one of becoming a CEO, he has repeated those things ad nauseum to the point where people inside Disney kind of joke, like, how was your vacation, Bob? And he'll say, great content, global expansion, you know, and, and there's also reality in that, that, um, you know, CEOs and all leaders have to kind of give themselves permission to be teased a bit by their employees. Because if you, you know, if people kind of roll, roll their eyes and, you know, poke you in the ribs, it's like, I know exactly what you're going to say. Um, then that's a victory because, you know, it does take like constant repetition for things to sink in. The other important insight about that Bob Iger example, and I can share others, but the important insight is that you can, you can very often look at these kind of simple plans. Um, that effective CEOs say and just go like, well, that's so obvious, right? Like that's like motherhood and apple pie. What else would it be? And so there is that fine line there, but it's like, it's worked for Disney. It's been, you know, the through line of their success. If you look at the, you know, he has built on every one of those three things and, you know, again, you know, it's worked for McDonald's, like from the, the time the company started growing. It's like quality, cleanliness, service and value. It's like, well, what else would it be? Well, it worked for them. Um, and so there is this kind of sweet spot. And the ones who get it well, you go, God, that makes sense. And as an employee, like to me, the key test is if you work for Bob Iger or another company where they, they do have a simple plan, you say, like, I get it. And I understand how the work that I'm doing contributes to that goal. Adam, when you say that, it's interesting. A friend just sent me, uh, he said, what do you think of my new business? I said, I don't know anything about it. He, he sent me 22 pages, but each page had, you know, really the equivalent of about five lines on it. And there was a nice picture and it was setting it up. And I read the 22 pages and he's a close friend. And I hope he does well. I have no idea if he's opening up a bait shop or a cleaning service or a computer company. Right. It was a great deal of beautifully well-written words that told me nothing. Yeah. So if he was a criminal, he'd probably be great because I'd know no more than when I started out. But uh, it didn't tell me about the company. As you said, the McDonald's had four or five key phrases or words, got to where they want to go. Is there a certain factor that you've observed in executives that 
uh, or in CEOs that provide a better return on investment. Uh, I'll use the example if they're all left handed or are bald executives wiser than the ones who haven't been that old. And, and that's really the question we try to answer with this book, because, you know, if we agree on a couple of foundational principles, leadership is incredibly hard. Right. Um, and people do kind of make it more complicated than it needs to be. And, you know, if you work in a big company and you're getting assessed and developed and all those things, I think there's a phenomenon, you know, the golf term, right? Paralysis by analysis. Like, you know, if you say, well, these are the 50 things I have to work on about my leadership and a fifth, another 50 things I'm going to be assessed on. You can't remember all that. So we really tried to, you know, the aperture on, on the lens, if you will, was like, what are the things that if you're a leader and you work on, you're going to get the greatest return on investment of your time and energy? And, and those are the seven things. This is the idea, like what is going to make or break you um, as a leader? And it you know, includes setting a simple strategy, culture, team, listening, which you know, so many people struggle with, especially in uh, positions of power, navigating a crisis. And also just in the last chapter, we, we shift to more sort of the internal part of leadership, and we call that mastering the inner game um, and just sort of, you know, figuring out how as a leader to be not just what you need to do. So that's kind of our focus for the last chapter. And I, I think you mentioned in the book, and I'd like to bring this up because it made an impression on me that when the leader can break it down into simple factors, that's also a great time management tool. And can you explain how the two of them are related? Sure. And, and it is, you know, the thing you appreciate is that, you know, as you go higher and higher in organizations, like if you're a CEO, you're, you're getting probably like 100 emails an hour, right? And things flying at you from from all different angles. Um, and it is like this idea of simplifying complexity. Another way to think of it is like, how quickly do you get to the essence of an issue? You know, I, I love this short phrase that a CEO once shared with me. It's like you talked about having a high get it factor, right? And you, you meet people like that. You're probably like that, Bill. It's like somebody explains something to you and you go, yeah, I get it. And that is, to me, it's like you've got the essence of it. So that ability, it's, it is part of triage because if all this stuff is coming at you, how quickly you can get to the essence of something and then figure out what, you know, is this a big problem? How do I deal with it? Ultimately, that is your time management tool and frankly, an energy management tool because, you know, it is so draining. Like these top jobs are are just such stamina tests, right? So the more you can kind of preserve your energy and have quick reflexes for assessing, you know, is this a big elephant? Is it a mouse? Is it like, is this an urgent problem? Can it, can this be handled six months later? The more quickly you can deal with that stuff, the more energy and brain space you're going to have for other challenges. You know, Adam, what I'm getting out of this, we haven't been talking even 20 minutes yet. And twice you pointed at me as a person with potential for CEO. So uh, I think I've got to update my resume and get it out there. And I've got to talk to you after the show because you're seeing a lot of those things that I've seen, but just the rest of the world is missed in, in my personality. <laughs> Before the show, we were talking about something that I love that you had written about in your book. Um, a couple of CEOs that you picked out, they kind of boiled things down to either one page or three key concepts, et cetera. And I thought, gee, how wonderful. You, you, once you know this, if, if the theory is be aggressive, that's what I want to do. But if it says be aggressive, but not too much, well, then I go forward and take two steps back. So could you talk about that? Sure. I, there are so many different frameworks and uh, approaches that people have come up to for setting strategy like there's you know it's all the but it's all the acronyms right bill there's kpis and okrs and at salesforce they have something called v2 mom and there's all these different kind of one page exercise I, i've looked at all and they all have merit the, the one that that i discovered that really resonates with all our mentoring clients is one that i heard and i was given full credit a guy named dinesh palawala ran harman international and his one page exercise has four parts to it. And the first part is you have to create kind of a one or two sentence summary of what you are trying to achieve. And those last words of what I just said are, are crucial. You know, it's what you are trying to achieve rather than just kind of a general description of the company or something. The second part is like, well, what are the three big levers you have to pull to achieve that goal? Then it's well, what are the three or four big challenges you have to overcome? to achieve that goal. Just kind of like, let's have a reality check on what we're up against. 
And the fourth part is having a scoreboard, you know, either like numerical progress or we're going to achieve these things by this date. And we just find like that creates such a valuable shared language. And it's a really good discipline for leaders and their teams. And then you say, well, that sounds so obvious. Like, why don't people do that? Or like, you know, what are, what are the ditches that people fall into when they're trying to do this exercise? And one of the things that I've often found, you know, Bill, if I had a magic wand, I, I, I think I'd get rid of the word priorities um, in the business world. And the reason is that I find that a lot of people, you know, the, the, you say, well, what are our priorities? And they start like listing like 10 or 12 or, you know, two dozen things because at some level, everything's a priority, right? But if you change the language, you get rid of the word priority and stick to this idea of like, what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to accomplish? You know, let's say a year from now, we want to look back and say, we had a good year. What does that mean? What did you have to accomplish? And rooting the conversation in that language is, is really clarifying and much more constructive because the problem with priorities, when, when I've done this with teams and they say, well, these are priorities, the key word to watch out for at the beginning of each bullet point is continue to. So if you're going to say one of your priorities is continue to do something, then that's not a priority because it means like you've, well, you've always done it and it's part of your business. So just having this kind of like shared understanding of, of, of how to talk about strategy in a really constructive way, I find is very powerful. And once again, we'd like to let our audience know if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Our guest today is Adam Bryant. He is the author of the book, CEO Test, Master the Challenges That Make or Break All Leaders. Adam, would you tell us again where we can get the book and the website that we should be looking at? Sure. My personal website is Adam Bryant Books. You'll find all the information there and also the booksellers, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles and all your favorite booksellers. And the website? Is, again, it's Adam Bryant Books is mine, dot com. Oh, I'm mine. sorry, dot com. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And to our audience, this, as we always like to have, this is a simple read. It's not something that's going to tax you and you can come out simply after reading it. Talk to the person sitting next to you and do a good, better job the next day by adopting one of these ideas or just getting your thought process following what Adam's learned. He's talked to 600 people. You don't have to do that. You just have to take what he's gotten from that, the summary of it, and see if it's right for you. And obviously, if the company or your organization isn't doing as well as you want, um, maybe it's time for a little bit of a change and to adopt one of these ideas. Adam, I'm just wondering when you mentioned before about people filling out that sheet between priorities and goals and what they're going for, does anybody ever come up to you and say, oh my gosh, by doing this, I found that this was the priority, but what I really want is that on the other side? Um, there's been a lot of revelations and what I, what I generally find, you know, I always tell people when I, when we work with leadership teams and we present this exercise, a lot of people, not a lot of people, some people will come up after, at the break and say, I'm done. And <laughs> what generally I say, well, I'd love to see it. And that's when you start seeing the common traps that people fall into. And what I, you know, always tell them is like, this takes time, like all good things that are acts of simplifying complexity, um, you know, and some of the traps they fall into, what I mentioned before, expertitis, like something is super clear to them um, or it's too granular. They're sort of down in the weeds of the 10 things that need to be done in the next 12 weeks. These are all the traps that people fall into. And so I always say to them, like, it's really good to change the frame and to help you kind of get out of your own head a little bit and to guard against this expertitis. So, you know, I always share like a few hypotheticals. I say, you know, imagine you were on the show Shark Tank, right? And you're standing up in front of that That's tough audience and you had to kind of pitch your plan and people are looking at you skeptically. Or here's a different audience. Let's say you were brought into your board of directors at your company and it was just before the lunch break and they're kind of cranky and they're kind of hungry and they, and they look at you and say, look, we're giving you all these resources. What are you doing with the money? And they want to know what you are trying to achieve. Or here's another framework. Let's say there's a hot talent prospect out on the job market. You're trying to hire them. Seven other companies are trying to hire them. 
you're sitting down with them and they're sort of looking at you like, well, how are you going to win? Like, why should I join your team? And just those kind of prompt questions making you realize like this is a different audience rather than talking to my colleagues who I know all this stuff. That, again, gets people out of their own head and helps overcome like expertitis and this sort of, well, isn't that obvious? No, it's not obvious. You have to communicate. It has to be clear. And it has to have this focus of like, I am going to achieve X, not just like we are in the business of drilling oil and selling it to customers. And I found, obviously, when I do that, it really works. And, and it just like opens up. It's like uh, I want to use the analogy when I go to the eye doctor. All of a sudden, he puts in that lens that you say, that's the one. He says, you like the right one? or the, That's the one. That's the one that clarifies everything. Um, you are just to make ourselves uncomfortable. Now, by nature, that's not what we want to do. We want to be comfortable getting that chair that we like and those soft shoes. Um, how do you mean that? How are we making ourselves uncomfortable? Yeah. And it's part of the discipline. Like when you're setting down to write your simple plan and, and your goals, look, there's a lot of leaders who work really hard most of their careers to get these top jobs. And let's be honest, some of them want to hold on to them. Um, and so they, they, they kind of minimize the risk of putting themselves out there. Um, because, you know, I always look at, uh, you know, the former CEO of my former company, the New York Times company, who back in 2015 set this really ambitious goal. I mean, we use it as a case study in the book where he said, he said, we're going to double digital revenue to 800 million by 2020. And, you know, you think about that, like as a leader, you're saying, we're going to achieve this. And like, what if you don't like, are you, you know, are you not the right CEO? You felt short of your goal. And I, I, I hold that up as an excellent example of, you know, a CEO who's willing to make himself and his team uncomfortable, like, because that was a big goal at the time. They blew through it and they've, they've had tremendous success. But at the time, it was like a bit of a gulp, right? Like, really? How are we going to do that? And, and so that is an example, like leaders have to sort of have that stretch goal where people go, how are we going to do that? Because that then leads to the discussion. And I think it's one of the reasons why when you ask for these strategy documents, they're actually not strategy documents because the CEO consciously or subconsciously is is in effect saying like, I just want to continue to keep doing what we're doing and not put myself at risk with an ambitious target that we might not meet. Has just in the last 10 seconds, has this changed the way you would hire someone or if you look at a company? Yeah, because, you know, it's interesting that the parallels um, build like I, I was a journalist for 30 years and, uh, you know, I was an editor, ran teams of reporters for 14 years. I, I learned um, fairly on in my editing career that when I would sit down with a reporter to talk about an idea, not like news breaking, but like an idea for an enterprise feature or something. I learned pretty early on to always ask the reporter the question, what's the 12 word pitch on that idea? And it's not like I was counting the words. They could have 20 or 25 or whatever. But just this kind of forcing function to just like get to the essence of the idea. It, it, it's like what you were just saying about your friend's business plan. It was 22 pages or whatever. Like if you were on the and phone with him and you said like, what's the 12 word pitch? Right. Exactly. And, with, you know, with some companies and ideas, it's easy. Like you think of like an Uber or an Airbnb, like you don't need more than 12 words to pitch that idea. Um, and then you say, well, why is it 22 pages and why can't I understand it? And it's because they're suffering from, again, what I call expertitis. They're too close to the subject. They're down in the weeds. They think you get all these nuances that they don't. So you have to pull yourself back. Adam, thanks for a great show. I want our audience to know we've been talking to Adam Bryant. He's the author of the book, The CEO Test. Adam, just before we wrap up, that website once again. Sure. AdamBryantBooks.com. All one word. Thank you. Easy enough to remember. Adam, thank you for being with us. We'd like our audience to know that you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.